Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to dive into the world of Revised. And I'm really looking forward to share my Revised collection with you. Revised was my alpha. I started playing magic in 1995 and my local game store still sold Revised. There was no fourth edition. So I actually started uh, my collection of magic by buying a starter deck that looked very much like this. And this is just an empty box though, but it looked like this. And I just remember having all these random beautiful cards. And one of the hardest things was kind of to collect the right basic land. So once you've chosen your colors to collect into the basics, but now in 2022, so, so many years later, I've got a full collection of revised and I actually have revised times four and they're in these four by four binders. So I'd like to share my collection with you today and maybe also share with you a few things that you didn't know yet about the revised collection. For example, revised is considered to be the third edition and it was followed up by the fourth edition and prior to this set was unlimited edition. And you're probably wondering why was it called third edition when you've got alpha, you've got beta, and then you've got unlimited, and then you have revised. So that should be the fourth edition. But actually, they look at Alpha and Beta as one. They call it Limited Edition. So they are Limited Edition Magic cards. And after that came the wide-bordered cards, the core sets, Unlimited, Revised, 4th Edition, etc. And why wide-border? Well, that's because what WOTC wanted to do was all the cards that got printed for the first time, they wanted to make those cards black-bordered. And all the cards that were reprints, they wanted to make it wide-bordered. So that way you could see if you were playing with a reprint card or with a card from the original core set or expansion. For example, all the Arabian Nights cards are black bordered, right? But when you've got a copy from, well, for example, Revised or Chronicles, they are white bordered. Okay, so are you ready to dive into Revised? Let's start the journey. Okay, so we're first going to start with, there we go, the artifacts here in Revised. And we can already see something that's quite unique at the time for a core set, and that is cards from expansions. You have to understand with limited edition alpha and beta and unlimited, you only had cards that were actually printed in the core sets. But then, for the first time in Magic's history, we got the first expansion, Arabian Nights, followed up by Antiquities, and then Revised was released. So in Revised, you see cards from those expansions. So here you see Aladdin's Lamp and Aladdin's Ring, two cards that are originally from the Arabian Nights. And um, here you can actually kind of get an idea of the power level at the time. Let me show you this card, Aladdin's Ring. So Aladdin's Ring is eight to cast, eight and tap to use. So you're 16 mana down. So what would you get for investing 16 mana? It's gotta be something Great, right? Probably you've won the game already. Well, not really. You can deal four damage to any target. So you could kill a Sarah Angel, not too bad, but I'm not quite sure if that's worth investing 16 mana. Now I do like this card. Um, I don't know why, and I've, I've actually played it in a Titania Song deck. So Titania Song is another card that we'll see in this collection, and it turns every artifact into a creature based on the casting cost. So this would turn into an 8-8 eight, eight creature. Then here we are at the second page. Let me kind of put the binary away. You can almost see the entire page. We've got here Basil Monolith, which is quite an, an exciting little card if you combine this with Power Artifact, because then you've got infinite mana, and you can imagine that infinite mana is a, is a pretty strong thing in, uh, in Magic. And here you've got Armageddon Clock, which is the first card that we see in this uh, in this video that actually comes from the Antiquities collection. So this is a reprint from Antiquities. Here we see two more reprints from Arabian Nights. Then when we continue, yeah, this card has always been bad. <laughs> Conservator, three and tap, prevent the loss of up to two life. So, you know, you can't even gain the life. You can only prevent the loss of life. You cannot prevent any damage with it, or else you could also use it in a combat situation. You can't, so it's strictly your life. So it's a very limited card, and it's a pretty bad card. And then here we see the row of eggs, the Dingus egg. Now Dingus egg was actually pretty infamous at the time, because you can combine Dingus egg with Armageddon. 
And when you do, you can win the game on the spot. Now, the cool thing is, um, when you do that, and when you do that today, you can actually stack the damage in a way that your opponent takes the damage first. So if you can then kill your opponent with an Armageddon and Dingus Egg, uh, it's, not, it's not going to be a draw. You can actually kill your opponent with it. So it's still pretty strong in my opinion. It is four to cast. And um, what it does, by the way, I haven't discussed it yet. Whenever anyone loses a land, Dingus Egg does two damage to that player for each land lost. Also nice to play this with Martyrs of Coralis, by the way, from the Antiquities. This is kind of something special. Dance at Scimitar. It's, uh, it's four to play. It's a one five and it's not even a wall. It's got flying. You can actually attack with it. But what I like about it is the picture because this is also the set symbol of Arabian Nights. So it's really cool to see that here getting a reprint in Revise. So it's the first reprint of Dancing Scimitar. Um, Disrupting Scepter, of course, a well-known card for uh, for being played in the deck, which is all about card advantage. Then we go to the next page. Yeah, this, ah, oh, it's such a cool card, Helm of Chatsuk. If you've read the novel Whispering Woods, there is a reference to Helm of Chatsuk. And um, I just think it's a cool card, beautiful colors and banding. I mean, it's it's a strong ability. This is, I think it's, it's a little bit underplayed. Um, oh, another card I want to talk about is a card from the Antiquities expansion, a card that's a little bit um, underwhelming. It's this card, Dragon Engine. Now, if you've read uh, the novel, The Brothers War, you know that Mishra controlled several Dragon Engines and the Dragon Engines gave him great fortune. He actually um, won over several cities in the book just based on one or two Dragon Engines alone. So you can imagine, when I first saw the Dragon Engine as a magic card, I was expecting it to have insane powers. Unfortunately, it was not to be. The card is just a 1-3 and um, for three mana. And this is actually a rare in Revise. So you can buy a Revise booster pack and this can be the rare. So be warned. There are a lot of mediocre rares in this set. Oh, how we mine, yep. Whenever somebody plays a Howling Mine, be wary. It's fun at first, but yeah, it'll slowly change. And here we go. We've got, yep, Ivory Tower, which is kind of the counterpart of Black Vice. We saw the Black Vice earlier. And then this card, Jandor's Ring. Another card, another ring. I don't know what it is with magic and rings that they're so expensive and so mediocre. Jandor's Ring is even worse than Aladdin's Ring. It's six to cast. Two and tap, so you've invested eight mana. What do you get? Discard a card you just drew from your library and draw another card to replace it. Now this card is strictly worse than Jalum Tome. Um, so Jalum Tome is uh, the little book from the Antiquities expansion, which is only three, I believe, to cast and two and tap to use. And then you get to draw a card and then you have to discard a card, but you can choose what card you want to discard. Right, and in the case of, of Jandor's Ring, you have to discard the card you just drew from your library and then draw another card to replace it, right? So you don't have a choice. So it's just, and I think it's too bad because I've always liked the fact that you've got Jandor's Ring, you've got Jandor's Saddlebags, so you can kind of already get the whole idea of who this person is and you can start making a theme deck around Jandor, but yeah, the ring is just too bad to do that. So never happened. And let's go to the next one. Yeah, interesting. Here we see the Jam Day Tome. So Jam Day Tome in old school, still one of the more popular cards because card advantage is so important and this just goes in any deck. And when you look closely, and I'm sure you know this already, um, you can see a face. So here you see the eyes of the book. There you see the mouth. And when you look at the pages, you actually see organs on the pages because the Jam Day Tome lives. It's a living book. So it's kind of, it's actually the first living artifact, you could say. Talking about living, look at this Cormus Bell. This is pretty neat. Cormus Bell is an artifact, right, for four that says treat all swamps you play as 1-1 one, one creatures. The cool thing about Cormus Bell is it actually makes them black creatures. That's a new oracle text. So if you combine this with a bat moon, you've got 2-2 two, two swamps, which is pretty, pretty good. You know, 2-2 two, two swamp army. Got the Mana Vault, this on the art, <laughs> oh, the Anson Manix. All the art of Anson is always so gruesome, the Living Wall. I used to play a lot with Living Wall. And 
And then we have mixstone, millstone. So this is where the term milling comes from. So millstone originally from the um, uh, antiquities expansion, two to cast, two and tap, and take the top two cards from target player's library and put them in target player's graveyard, right? So with this, you had an alternative win con. So instead of killing somebody by putting their life total on zero, you could now kill somebody by milling their deck, making sure that they didn't have any cards anymore to draw. And uh, there's a deck in old school with this, with a uh, field of dreams called mill of dreams. So that's quite a nice combo when you make sure that your opponent only draws cards that are not gonna help him, basically just lands, and you're gonna mill away the rest. It's, uh, it's a pretty fun deck to play with, not to play against. Yeah, and this card, I've always found this a bit underwhelming as well, Mishra's War Machine. So, you know, Mishra was such a powerful uh, artificer, right? And then all he could really do was create this 5-5 five, five Bander with during your upkeep, you have to discard one card of your choice from your hand or Mishra's War Machine becomes tapped and does three points of damage to you. At least you can choose what card you want to discard. That's the only silver lining. So maybe you could combine this in uh, a reanimator deck and discard more big fatties. I don't know really, but maybe that's an option. Talking about silver lining, did you know that they actually wanted to give Revised a silver border? So they were thinking about that, giving Revised a silver border, but they changed their minds and kept it white. Then we've got, here we've got now, Neural Disc, of course, which goes really well with a regeneration strategy, like with the Set Troll or with Zombies, right? Give it regeneration, my zombie uh, disco deck. And then we've got um, Obsidian's Golems. Maybe it's nice, look at this. Look at this Golem. This Golem has been places. Let me take it out of the sleeve for you. I just love it. I love it when a card has, uh, has been to places. Let's see if it can zoom into there properly. Oh, oh, oh. Anyway, um, what I like so much about this is um, this kind of shows how I collected the last, the fourth copy of my set. So as you can see, I have four of each. And in the end, I thought, okay, card number four, I wanna see if I can get cards from the community or if I can get old cards that I have laying around somewhere that I've been really torn and played with. Um, so that's why Usually the fourth card in my collection is, well, not really minty fresh. Let's put it that way. Here we go. Onulet, another card that's mentioned in the Brothers War story. And let's see, there we go. Primal Clay, Rocket Launcher. Rocket Launcher is really good to use with um, Guardian Beast. Because Rocket Launcher destroys itself after it's being used, but we, when you've got Guardian Beast, it actually comes back, you know, because all the artifacts are indestructible, have indestructible, so it comes back, it's quite nice. Then you've got Soul Net, which is actually surprisingly strong to use in uh, multiplayer games. And this, of course, Rod of Ruin, which is a Timmy on a stick. I did a nice article about um, Protocol Sorcerer that I read from the Duelist where the author claimed that Rod of Ruin is the better option over a Protocol Sorcerer if you want to play competitively with this effect, which is kind of funny. Um, so yeah, that's, that's Rod of Ruin. So I, I guess it used to be powerful. Talking about used to be powerful, um, the Hive, another great uh, example of the power level of magic in those days. So the Hive is five to cast, five and tap, and then you can create one, one, one flying creature. So you're investing 10 mana, and then you've got a one, one flyer, right? That is really old school for you. The whole idea of um, you being able to actually create your own creatures was seen as extremely powerful, you know? And that's why it's so expensive to make this. And actually in old school, you can still find use for these. And here we go, Throne of Bone. Yeah, this, oh man, this art. I know, I keep just showing you cards, but Throne of Bone, this is uh, a skull of some kind of animal. So if you look closely, you can see the two eyes. Here you can see uh, kind of the jaws, right? It's something quite powerful. Anyway, and here you can see, of course, the wizard sitting on the Throne of Bone. Really cool art, really liked it. 
And then Winter Orb, and Winter Orb is one of the two artifacts together with Howling Mind that you can actually turn off by tapping it, and you can still do that. So when you've got Winter Orb, if you've got an Icy Manipulator or a Relic Barrier, you can tap it, and then it no longer works anymore. So in the right deck, you can really take, take an advantage of that. And then the last card of the artifacts, and now we're already done with the artifacts and revised, is the Wooden Sphere. And the Wooden Sphere has art by Mark Tedden. And the cool thing about that is that Mark Tedden likes to make spheres because he also made Chaos Orb, which is a pretty cool sphere, which is unfortunately not in the revised collection. That would have been so sweet. Anyway, Wooden Sphere, kind of nice art. Not very useful, tap to um, gain one life whenever a green spell is being cast. Okay, so this is it for the artifact section of this video, and now we're gonna continue with the white cards. So here we go with white, and actually when you look at the value uh, of the set revised, there, I think white has the least value of all. Here we see uh, four animated wolves talking about cards with a low value. Um, Animate Wool, again, is a rare, so you can buy a booster pack of Revise, you can find a Dragon Engine, but you can also find an Animate Wool as your rare. So remember that whenever you're tempted to buy like a single booster pack of Revise, there's so many rares that you can draw that are really like bad. Um, I do like um, Animate Wool, by the way, because it's, it's a very simple, basic synergy, right? You know that you need to play Animate Wool with a wool. And what these type of cards did, at least for me as a player, is it made me realize that, hey, wait a minute, certain cards work better with other cards. I can come up with these things that we can call combinations, later called combos, right? And I know that in today's competitive magic scene, a combo is always has to be something in, in, infinite that makes you win the game or does something extremely awesome. Back in the day, a combo was simply putting your animate wall on a wall because it's a combination of cards that works well. Put this on your Wall of Swords, and you had a pretty impressive creature. Um, talking about um, impressive creatures, Banalish Hero, a card that I think is a little bit underplayed, it used to be played more. Uh, it's a 1-1 one, one for 1 white, and it has Banding. And Banding is just something um, that is just extremely strong, right? And the nice thing about Banalish Hero, if you know the lore a little bit, um, Banalish heroes come from uh, a place, a city-state called ben uh, Banalia. I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing it wrong, but anyway, it was a big city-state with only heroes, basically warriors. So it's it's a whole city and everybody's a warrior. Like you get trained as a child and stuff. Let me try to put it, show it to you correctly. A lot of people think that she's got uh, short hair, by the way, but actually when you look closely, there is a ponytail here. So she has long hair, ladies and gentlemen. I know this is news, but she has long hair. Okay, oh, and before I forget Armageddon, uh, one of the most powerful cards in white ever, still sees a lot of play. Talking about powerful cards, here we have a balance. And maybe you're wondering, why is there only one balance in? Let me show you, beautiful art by, uh, by Mark Poole. The reason that I'm only showing you one balance and that I only have one balance in my binder is that this card is restricted in any format or at least any format that I play. So I've decided that cards that are restricted like Brain Geyser, Wheel of Fortune Channel, those cards I only have as a one-off. Because it looks like these cards are always in their binder, right? In this binder, but actually they're not. I play with them a lot. I take them out and make a lot of revised decks. But of course for this video, I've put everything back in to kind of show you the full collection. So here we see uh, Blessing, beautiful art. There we go. Castle, another card. Uh, a lot of these cards have now changed Oracle text. So um, whenever you're building a deck around a card, I would really advise you to go to Gatherer, type in the card and check the current Oracle text. For example, this um, card, Castle, reads, your untapped creatures gain plus O plus two, um, attacking creatures do not get this bonus. Now, it clearly states that attacking creatures do not get this bonus, but guess what? In the updated Oracle text, all the untapped creatures get this bonus. So you can combine this with Johan, for example, and have a huge uh, bumped up army, right? They all get plus O plus two extra. And also your Sarah Angel is now a permanent four six when you've got a castle on a battlefield. 
So maybe that's just nice for you to, um, to remember, to keep in mind. Obviously, we do see the circle of protections here, which is what made white very strong. I remember that uh, we never played with circles of protection. We thought they were kind of like cheating. Uh, but we also didn't play with direct damage. So we just had a lot of like <laughs> alternative rules. Back in my day, there we see some more cards here. Another nice card from Arabian Nights. I really like the art. I mean, look at a huge sword. And again, this is a card for me that invites me to brew because of the last sentence. So if we read eye for an eye, right? Um, can be cast only when a creature spell or effect does damage to you. Eye for an eye does an equal amount of damage to the controller of that creature spell or effect. And now this is this is the sentence that kind of makes me want to brew with it. Um, if some spell or effect reduces the amount of damage you receive, it does um, it does not reduce the damage dealt by eye for an eye. So in other words. If somebody plays a fireball on you for 10, uh, you can play an eye for an eye, you can deal 10 damage back, but you can also play reverse damage so that you gain 10 life. So then you gain 10 life and your opponent takes 10 damage. I know it's gonna cost you two cards, it's not brilliant, but you know those are kind of the things that I'm thinking about when I read like a little sentence like, like that and I start thinking, what can I you know, brew with it? It's, it's very inviting. Got the next page, Farmstead, oh, also a rare. You can draw this as a rare out of your booster. Man, I have to say the art makes up for a lot though. And we see the green ward, we see Guardian Angel, which you can combine with Paralyze. Well, not combine, but when you look at the art, you'll, you'll know what I mean. And we've got Healing Saf, which is part of the Boon Cycle, right? So the Boon Cycle is Healing Saf, Ancestral Recall, which unfortunately is not reprinted in this set, uh, Dark Ritual, Lightning Bolt, and Giant Grove. So Healing Soft is the weakest of, of, the, of that cycle, but it's still an interesting cycle. It all just costs one mana and they're all instants. And here we see Island Sanctuary. Again, Mark Poole has made a lot of great art. Island Sanctuary is kind of like your budget moat. People used to combine this with uh, how uh, no, uh, not Howl from Beyond, with Howling Mine. So you could still draw one card and also be protected from uh, attacks from your opponent. Uh, Lance, this card actually didn't get a reprint after Revised. It's quite interesting. There we see Northern Paladin. You can combine that with Sleight of Mind. Pearl Unicorn. Yeah, this card, uh, Personal Incarnation. If you play this, you're really kind of a legend. Every wizard that has the guts to play this is a great wizard in my book. It's a 6-6, six, six, 3 white and 3 to cast. And uh, caster can redirect any or all damage done to Personal Incarnation to self instead, right? So, so far, the card is kind of okay-ish, right? It's still 6 mana for 6-6, six, six, but in old school, it's actually pretty, pretty okay. The source of the damage is unchanged. So... You know, when somebody deals four damage to this, you can choose to put four damage on yourself instead or part of that damage. If, but this is where the card gets, yeah, bad. If personal incarnation goes to the graveyard, caster loses half of his or her remaining life points, rounding up the loss. So if you're on like 13, you're gonna lose seven life, right? You're gonna drop to six. And here you can see the wizard, by the way. I really like the art. Um, this is the same artist that also did uh, for Jiren Enchantress and Ke uh, Keldon Warlord. So I, I love the art, but the risk, it's just a huge, huge risk if you play this out. And that's, I guess that's why you don't see it often. One terror and you lose half your life. Remember that. Still play it though. Anyway, we've got the, the pigeon, we got the wards. Yeah, this card, Resurrection, was combined a lot with Wrath of Gods. You would play a Wrath, and then you would get your top creatures back with Resurrection. We've got Reverse Damage, we discussed it earlier. Reverse Polarity from the Antiquities expansion. And yeah, we've got Righteousness, which is a card I actually play in one of my wall decks. It's really good to combine Righteousness with Sword of the Ages at the right moment. Got Semite Healer. A lot of people, by the way, this may be nice to discuss. They kind of see a face in the uh, in the smoke of Semite Healer, like here. If you look close, I'm not quite sure if my 
Camera is good enough to pick it up. But here you can see a face. You can see the nose. You can see the mouth. It's quite nice. Samite Healer, the opposite of the Timmy, of course. Savannah Lion, one of the only vanilla creatures in old school that sees a lot of play. Talking about cards that see a lot of play, Sarah Angel. Yeah, Sarah Angel is just such an epic card and still in old school, one of the best creatures around. Just the fact that you don't have uh, uh, to tap or to attack with it makes her so good. And like I said earlier, if you combine this with a castle, you've got a permanent 4-6. And then we have Swords to Plowshares. Of course, that card is just too good in my opinion. I wish it would um, put the creature in the graveyard instead of remove it from the game. I do get the flavor, but yeah. I mean, at least when it goes through graveyard, you can still get it back. It's, it's, it's just so good. Veteran Bodyguard, a card that is not reprinted in 4th edition. And the art of Veteran Bodyguard was inspired by uh, the actor uh, Lou, do you say Lou Ferrigo? I'll put, I'll put a picture up. He played the Hulk um, in those days. Pretty beefy dude. And uh, yeah, he was the inspiration for the art of Veteran Bodyguard. And we're almost at the end of white. Going to step into blue. So here we see the Wall of Swords. The White Knight, of course, a card that still sees a lot of play. And was kind of followed up, I guess, by the Pump Knight, the Order of Lightbearer in, uh, in Fallen Empires. And here, Wrath of God. Now, this is a card I want to take a moment because there are a few things happening in this card that you may not be aware of, or maybe you are. But first up, here's a face. If you look closely, you see the eyes, the nose, the mouth. So there's a face, right? So you've got the face of God, I guess. Um, but also, I mean... Look Look at the picture a little bit more closely. You can see a lot of interesting things. Some people say that this, for example, uh, depicts uh, Jesus Christ. There's also an interesting thing happening here. Uh, we've got an orc. I just think the art in general, it's just beautiful because there's so much to see, right? There's just, it's really a Quentin Hoover piece. You can keep staring at this and I still do from time to time and still find new details. So it's, it's quite a nice, a card and it's really good because all creatures in play are buried, which is a strong effect. But the fact that they're not destroyed but buried means that you cannot regenerate your creatures, making it really powerful for white because white has no regeneration creatures, right? It does have death ward, but that's it. Like it's it's got no creatures with regeneration, so it's really great to um, to use wrath of God and then use that resurrection. Okay, so I guess now it's time to uh, to jump into blue. And here we are at the color blue. Now, obviously blue is, I guess, my favorite color. Although, to be honest, this is the cheesy answer. I kind of like every color. I like playing with every single color. But when I first started Magic, I was really more focused on, on blue, I guess, blue and red. And uh, what I liked about blue is, well, Air Elemental. Look at the art of Air Elemental. I mean, Richard Thomas did such an amazing job on this card. The rich golden background, all the different shades of blue of the air elemental herself. It's just a beautiful composition. And I understand it's a 4-4 four, for four, 5, right? A flyer and you've got Sangir Vampire and you've got Sarah Angel, which are strictly better. But you have to take uh, into consideration that this is a blue card. So in blue to have a creature, a 4-4 four, for four, 5 with an upside is actually really good in blue. So... Air Elemental, I still feel it's kind of underestimated. Um, it's a really good card. I play with it in my Timmy Spellbook deck. And yeah, it's just it's just a joy to play with. Every time I cast it, I, I, I feel like I've won the game already. But actually the card that made me fall in love with blue is on the second page. And no, it's not the Protocol Sorcerer. It's actually Clone. Clone is the first card that I have active memory of of pulling it out of a booster pack. And I think the reason that I've got such an active memory of pulling it out of there is the two asterisks here at the bottom of this card. It really kind of mesmerized me. I was like, what is what, what is this card about? It can be anything. I don't even have to own a Shivan Dragon, but I can copy it with clone. Felt like it was so ridiculously powerful that I really wanted to play with blue. And then of course I discovered that there was also a card here we see it, Control Magic which allows me to steal the card as well so I can clone it and it can control it. I mean, 
that's kind of crazy, right? Isn't that crazy good? And also you have to understand these two cards are uncommons. So at the time they were quite easy for me. Well, easy is a big word, but they were easier for me to acquire than let's say a Vesuvan Doubleganger or a Mahmoudi Jin or a Lord of the Pit or a Shivan Dragon or something. Like these cards were actually in my grasp. I could get them. I could at least get one or two copies and I could play with them. So for me, that was really what made me want to play um, with blue. And as I started to discover the color more and more, I discovered beautiful cards like Copy Artifact, one of the more valuable cards in the set, by the way. And, and, and then I discovered Counter Magic. But Counter Magic for me is more a means to, towards an end, but it's never the goal, right? I'm not, in that way, I'm not really a counter player. I've kind of turned into one, you know, playing with a lot of blue. But um, yeah, the reason I fell in love with blue or just the clone, the control magic, the fact that you can copy and steal things with blue, I just think it's really cool. And also, of course, the Tim himself, but we'll talk about Tim later. Um, and here we go, we've got Creature Bond, we've got, yeah, Drain Power, one of those cards where, you know, I play a lot of Swedish old school and Swedish old school plays according to the modern magic rules. And, and that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. But one of the uh, downsides of the format is that there's no mana burn in the format. So that means that drain power is more difficult to play. Just in case that you're not familiar with the card, I'll, I'll share it here with you. So two blue to cast. And what it does, it's, uh, it's a sorcery. It reads, opponent must draw all the mana from his or her available lands, this mana, and add all mana in opponent's mana pool, drains into your mana pool. You can't take less than all your opponent's mana. So the problem when you don't play with mana burn is that your opponent can simply tap all his or her lands in response to you casting drain power. Now, I guess then the small advantage that you have is that all the lands of your opponent are tapped. So maybe when you play with Winter Orb or something, it could be useful. Um, but yeah, in general, the card is just a little bit more weaker when you're not playing with Mana Burn. And there are a few other cards here in Revised that without Mana Burn are just not as useful. And that's that's kind of a shame because I think it's it's one of those cards that you want to uh, uh, brew around. You know, it's, it's a cool card. Talking about cool cards, uh, Enchant Enchantment. <laughs> this card hardly sees any play, but I think it's really cool. This is the Enchant Enchantment. I mean, you don't see that anymore. It's an enchant enchantment. How cool is that? Again, the art of Quentin Hoover, phenomenal, phenomenal. And and one of the only like anti enchantment cards in 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 the core set. Uh, Hercules Recall, very useful, very nice art by um, by Nene Thomas. And then here we go, Island Fish Jesconicus. Talking about power level of creatures, look at this big beast. So it's seven to cast. And what do you get for seven? Well, you get a six, eight flyer and it actually has multiple downsides. So it's already seven for a six, eight, which is, I guess, kind of okay in those days. But then look at the downsides. You must pay three blue during your upkeep phase to untap the fish. And it cannot attack unless your opponent has islands in place. So it doesn't even have island walk. No, it can only attack when your opponent has islands. I guess they call it island home now. It's kind of the same ability as a, a sea serpent. And look at this as well. Island fish is destroyed immediately if at any time you have no islands to play, just like a pirate ship. Man, why did they do that? Why not just give it island walk and that's it, you know? The card would not be overpowered, Watsy. It would not be. And then we have Lord of Atlantis, which is one of the stronger lords. You've got three lords in the game, right? You've got Goblin King, You've got Lord of Atlantis and you've got Zombie Master. Now, Lord of Atlantis is just the most powerful for the simple reason it's only two blue to cast and it does the same thing as the Goblin King, but then for Merfolk, it's just insane. So two blue to cast, all Merfolk can play again, Island Walk and plus one, plus one, while this card is in play. So I have no idea why it's one generic mana cheaper than the other two. Uh, some simply said that the person who created the Lord of Atlantis, who made up the card, was just so fond of merfolks, he thought they should be slightly stronger. What I do like in the game, though, is that in the core set, they've kind of balanced it because you only have merfolk of the Pearl Trident as your only other merfolk, and it's just a 1-1. One -one. And when you look at the Goblin King, for example, you've got Mons Goblin Raiders, you've got a Goblin Balloon Brigade, so there are actually quite a lot of goblins in there. 
Um, and also when you look at the zombies, there's only scave zombies next to the zombie master, but the scave zombies is a tutu. So I do kind of feel that that's the way that they, you know, balanced it out. But obviously on the long run, that didn't really work out that well anymore. Um, magical hack, kind of cool. Uh, I found out something new about magical hack. Um, when was that? A year ago, two years ago? With magical hack, you can actually hack a basic land. So a swamp, you can hack it into an island if you want to, or a mountain into a plains, because you can change the text of any card being played or already in play by replacing one basic land type with another. For example, you can change swamp walk to plains walk. So you can change a tap for a mountain into tap for an island. So um, that, that's kind of cool. That's what you can do with magical hack. Mahamoti Jin, such a cool card. Such a cool card. I remember when um, I kind of started really, you know, playing at events again and uh, getting away from the kitchen table. And the first thing I did was just buy a lot of revised cards. And I was surprised that cards like Mahamoti Jin are just completely worthless. I mean, you know, we talk about, I guess they have some value now, you know, but they used to be like 10 cents for a mint copy uh, of revised. They just had no value at all. And back in the day, you know, back in the day, when I played Revised, when these things were on the counter, you actually were paying like $10 for, for a Mahamoti. There we go. So this is already the last page, but not the last page of my collection. So we see Mana Short, here the Murphy of the Pearl Trident, Phantasmal Forces. We're going to close this binder and we're going to get the second one. Let me get... There we go. Let's put the starter deck over there. We've got a nice new binder for you with even more cards. Da -da -da -da. Let's get it straight. There we go. The first page is already a good one. We see a Phantasmal Terrain. We see Phantom Monster, Pirate Ship. Pirate Ship is so cool. People should play Pirate Ship more. Pirate Ship is another rare. So when you buy that revised booster pack that we've been talking about, you can also draw into a pirate ship. And pirate ship also has this thing called Island Home, right? If your opponent plays a tsunami, for example, and yes, this has happened to me, you lose all your islands, but also your pirate ship sinks, which is really, really bad. Like you're having a bad day. So pirate ship also has that ping effect of the Tim. There we see the Tim, the Timmy. So what I've always liked about the Tim, and again, this is all about accessibility, right? When I started as a player, is that one of the strongest cards in Revised was considered Royal Assassin. It was just huge, right? And Royal Assassin is a rare, so it's really hard to come by. But with Protocol Sorcerer, I could kill the Royal Assassin. And this is just a common. So I was like, aha, in my blue deck, I'll play Protocol Sorcerer and I'll ping your, uh, um, your Royal Assassin to death. And also, uh, don't underestimate the amount of creatures that were being played that just had one toughness. Like you had uh, Savannah Lions, but also Elvish Archers, which was like a card that saw a lot of play. Um, you could also ping a Birds of Paradise with this. It, it, it's really useful. Of course, it's three to cast. It's slow, I know that, but it's, it's really useful. There we've got the Mustard Man. There we've got Resurrection, uh, sorry, um, Reconstruction. The cool thing about Reconstruction is this is, of course, uh, a reprint from the Antiquities expansion. If you have it from the Antiquities expansion, one of the things you'll notice is that it doesn't have the set symbol. So it only has a black border. So for Reconstruction, it's almost like there's an antiq a beta version, but it's actually the Antiquities version. It just doesn't have the set symbol. This is really nice psychic uh, venom on your uh, opponent's city of brass. It's great. There we go. Oh, yeah, here's a famous, famous re uh, misprint of a reprint. So here we have Surrendip Afrit. And Surrendip Afrit obviously is a card from Arabian Nights, but this is not the art of Surrendip Afrit. So multiple things went wrong here. So first off, it's green instead of blue, right? Isn't this a blue card? Well, it really is because you play, uh, pay blue for it, but it's green. And uh, this is actually the art of If Biff Afrit. If Biff Afrit is a very powerful uh, creature in Arabian Nights with a hurricane effect that is not reprinted in Revised, but Surrender Afrit is. 
and Surrender Profit has completely different art. You know what, I'll, I'll, I'll show it here so that you can compare the two cards. And um, imagine if Surrender Profit would have been properly reprinted and revised, then probably the price of Surrender Profit will be, uh, would have been a lot lower than it is today. Because if you want an, an OG Surrender Profit, you know, from Arabian Nights, it's, uh, wow, it's ridiculously expensive. But the revised copy, I think, is still pretty affordable, although it's been going up a little bit as well. And here we have the infamous st Stasis. So Stasis is a deck that was built with cards like Birds of Paradise and Instal Energy, right? You can have this combination where you could keep your Stasis around forever. And then you would have like a Wincon, you would have like a Black Vice or something, or uh, a Yoshin Soldier because that can attack without tapping. So um, yeah, Stasis, really, really strong card. One blue and one an enchantment. And players do not get an untap phase. And you have to pay one blue during your upkeep or Stasis is destroyed. Cards still do not untap until um, the next untap phase. And what I find so cool about this card is the design of the card. It basically has a cumulative upkeep before you had that type of upkeep, right? It took us all the way um, uh, to Ice Age to actually have that type of upkeep. But here, this actually has the same effect because you have to pay the blue before um, you go into your upkeep, um, sorry, to after your untap step, right? So if you cannot pay the blue, the stasis destroys itself and then your opponent is the first one who gets to untap everything, right? So it's actually quite a balanced card when you look at it from that perspective. Now, obviously there are a lot of shenanigans that you can do so that you're the first one to untap instead of your opponent. Time walk being uh, one of the more straightforward ways to accomplish that goal. Um, and maybe it's nice to note that the art, I know there's a lot of, um, well, a lot, I mean, but there is some um, comments on the art that people say the art is, is bad. Now, first off, it's really hard to give a value judgment towards art because it's very personal. You have to like the style. So this is a specific style of art. I think it's good art because it's iconic. You remember the card. Everybody recognizes the art of stasis. I mean, there are so many cards today in Magic the Gathering and art is just pretty meaningless on a lot of them. But this art, you can really see, oh yeah, this is stasis. That's such a funky piece of art. And uh, the story is that Faye Jones, the artist, is actually the aunt of, um, of Richard Garfield. And, you know, she just made this piece as a one time and she hardly ever signs. So. It's, I like, I like the story. I like that it's, you know, this unique art for such a unique card. I think everything comes together here. I'm a big fan of the art, big fan of the card for its epicness, but not a big fan of Stasis decks. Does that make sense? Anyway, let me know in the comments below if that makes sense. Spell Blast. Have you ever Spell Blasted uh, a Black Lotus for one, uh, for zero actually? So just one blue, you can counter Black Lotus with this one. It's quite great, pretty cool. So we got steel artifacts, so more stealing going on. And then we have, yeah, Wall of Error, one of the better walls actually in the game of Magic. Again, doesn't see a lot of play because people don't play walls anymore, especially since you've got now, even in old school, you've got options like Maze of If, which are just better than a Wall of Error, but Still, walls have something iconic. I think it's it's really cool. Whenever somebody plays with a wall, I really kind of, I respect that because it's really going back to those early days of Magic. I remember um, we used to go to my nephew to play Magic. He had this cardboard box. And one of the first cards that I would pick out was a wall of ice because it just, it's seven defense for three mana. It's so good. I thought it was so good. And now, of course, later in life, you realize, okay, a wall of ice is not everything, but... You know, back then it was great having a wall, having a couple of Timmies behind your wall, it's awesome. And here we see a Vesuvan Double Ganger, obviously one of the more iconic cards in the set. Beautiful art, again by Quentin Hoover. I remember I remember people playing with decks where they would clone their Vesuvan and then they would also play with red and they would copy the Shivan Dragon. I mean, how badass is that? Yeah, games used to take a little bit longer back in those days. And ooh, we're almost gonna dive into black. So we're getting uh, well underway in this video. Another nice wall here, wall of water. Counterpart, of course, being wall of fire. Here we see another elemental, water elemental. 
Maybe a nice thing to note about water elemental is I used to think it was the guy in the boat, but it's not the guy in the boat. Of course, it's the wave here. You can see the face of the elemental and the hand of the elemental. And uh, let me just show a little bit closer. So here you can see the face and you can see the hand. So 5-4 and of course the fire elemental is its counterpart. I think from an art perspective, it would have been cool if the water elemental would be like a beefy blue guy because fire elemental is like a foxy red elemental. Um, but I guess I also like this because it's kind of iconic because everybody used to think it was the guy in the boat. It's actually his little wave. So yeah, that's it for water elemental. And now we've reached the color black, one of the strongest colors in revised. Okay, so we're going to dive into the world of black. And yeah, black is actually known for its destruction. And I find it kind of interesting because black doesn't have the best removal spells in the game. Think about that. At least not in the old school era that we're talking about. Um, but what black is really good at though is animating creatures, bringing creatures back from the dead. So here we've got animate dead. Um, something I really like about this card, let's just try to get it on the camera, is uh, it's an enchant dead creature. So I love that stuff. So it can get a creature back from any graveyard. Uh, it does get minus O minus, uh, sorry, minus one minus O. Um, but it's really good because you can just choose any uh, graveyard. And look at this, we've got the wizard here. Great art by Anson Maddox as well. Really good card, very useful. And people still play it in today's old school scene. Um, there we see the Bad Moon. So I talked earlier about combining Bad Moon with the Cormus Bell, uh, Black Knight. It's always been kind of a staple in Black Knight, especially in the sideboards, because you cannot sort a Black Knight. That makes it really, really good. Sorts of Plows here is one of the most used pieces of creature removal in the game. Probably the best piece of creature removal. And then we see here Contract from Below. Now, this is a card that I want to talk about. So Contract from Below is probably the best magic card. You know, and you're probably thinking, what? No, that's Black Lotus, Ancestral Recall. No, no, no. Time Walk. No, it's actually Contract from Below if you play for Anti. So let's first just read this card and then I'll, I'll explain why. So one black, Sorcery, discard your current hand and draw eight new cards, adding the first drawn card to your Anti. Remove this card from your deck before playing if you're not playing for Anti. So first we have to discuss what Anti is, right? So Anti means... Uh, the way magic used to be played was you would shuffle up your library. The first card of your library you would place in front of you, that would be your anti card and your opponent would do the same. Both of these cards uh, were up for grabs. If you would win the game, you would win the anti card of your opponent and you would get your own card back, right? So you would be up a card. If you would lose the game, uh, your opponent would get your card. Now you can imagine that anti wasn't very popular with a lot of players because you don't want to stand a chance of actually losing your best card in your deck or a card that you've been working so hard on to acquiring that you can just lose that in a match. So eventually Anti kind of died out, but yeah, it, it, when Anti was still there, um, you know, this card is just incredibly good. Can you imagine having no cards in hand but your contract from below? One black mana and you draw seven new cards okay eight but that first card goes up for anti but seven new cards if you then still cannot win the game i mean i'm sorry then you've just built a really mediocre deck you're probably me anyway um dark ritual part of the boon cycle i talked about earlier with healing soft ancestral recall dark ritual uh lightning bolt and giant grove so really good card of course dark ritual into hypnotic specter i think we're gonna find the hippie here oh not yet it's kind of a well-known strategy, right? Uh, we see the Demonic Hordes did not get um, a reprint in 4th uh, edition. So one of the more valuable cards in, in black, I believe, at the moment. Talk about value, uh, we've got Demonic Tutor here. Obviously the card in black uh, with the most value. So one black and one to cast for sorcery. That reads, search your library for one card and take it into your hand. Reshuffle your library afterwards. Now, the cool thing is this is a card that when I started playing Magic, I didn't value it very much. I thought, why not just play with the card you're looking for, and then you've got a bigger chance of actually getting it. But obviously now I know that, why is it so good? Because it's situational. In whatever situation you are in the game, you can use your tutor and you can find something useful. Sometimes you will tutor for a land, just because you have to. You've got to do what you've got to do. 
in a lot of cases in old school, people search for their ancestral recall just because you get some extra cards and then you'll probably have that land that you're looking for. But I always like it when somebody tutors it and picks up something that I really don't expect and wins the game with it. That's Those are my favorite tutor moments. So Demonic Tutor goes back here. Then we've got, yeah, this is kind of nice, El Hajash. Uh, I think it's the first card with a lifelink effect. So El Hajash, two black and one, originally from Arabian Nights, it's a one one. Uh, when you attack with it and it deals damage, you actually gain one life for every point of damage that El Hajash inflicts. Now, I'm not quite sure how to use this card, but I want to, so let me know in the comments below if you found a way to play with El Hajash in your old school deck. And let's see, yeah, we've got Evil Presence. I, I love the simplicity of Evil Presence. Just one black enchant land turns a land into a swamp. It's really good with swamp walks. Sometimes magic is just really easy. Accept it. It doesn't always have to be overcomplicated. Um, then we have Gloom, which is so good against the Circles of Protection. It's, it's in almost every sideboard that plays black. And yeah, the infamous Hypnotic Spectre. I think Hypnotic Spectre is even a good card in today's standard. It's such a good card. Talking about infamous, here we have Mind Twist. And earlier on in this video, I talked about my love for Clone. And Clone is, the art by, uh, of Clone is made by Julie Barrow. And Julie Barrow also made the card of, uh, the art of a card that I like the least, which is Mind Twist. And maybe you're wondering, what does this guy have against Mind Twist? The main thing is that Mind Twist gets better when you have access to power, right? Because then your opponent can potentially like twist your hand in turn one. It's like, it's so brutal. And then you kind of have a non-game going. That being said, um, I don't believe in banning any cards. One of the things I love about old school is nothing is banned. You can play with everything. That's part of the charm. And getting a Mind Twist every now and then, it's, it's part of the game. When you play old school, it's part of the game. Uh, talking about part of the game, a card that doesn't see a lot of play, unfortunately, but used to see more play, is Lord of the Pit. Uh, just a really cool card. Um, if you've read the Alpha Rulebook, there's a story about a wizard's duel between Wartzel and Tomil. I believe his name is Tomil. And um, Tomil uses black magic and conjures up one of these Lord of the Pits. Now, if you want to know the rest of the story, check out, just go and, and Google or something, Alpha Rulebook, uh, Wurzel versus Tomil. I'm sure you'll find the story. It's pretty entertaining to read. Yeah, I mean, all these cards are epic. You know, I could, I could, I could spend hours talking about, about the cards in this set. Here we do see a card that I want to talk about, not because of its ability. It is a good ability, though, but because of um, the art. So this is art by Ansematics. And he's made Paralyzed, the art for Paralyzed, but also the art for Guardian Angel. And uh, look at this. Let me see if I can get it on the camera. Oh, oh, yep, there, there, there it is. So here you can see that beam continues. And I believe somebody asked Anson Maddox, like, is there an idea behind this? And there's not really an idea behind it. Because here, obviously, in the case of Paralyzed, it's like a beam that's forcing the creature to be tapped and paralyzed. And here it's a beam of healing, right? You're kind of healing a creature. So it doesn't make sense that it's the same beam, but art-wise, I mean, yeah, you can't deny that, that there is a connection here. But yeah, really, really nice. So let's just put this one back. Ooh, and then I actually see another piece of art that I want to discuss, and that is the Royal Assassin, obviously, one of the stronger cards, and this was really a chase card uh, back in the day of Revised. So two black and one, a one one, and you can tap it to destroy any tapped creature. So that's just insane value. And also when you combine that with uh, with this card, the Nettling Imp, right? You can force your opponent to attack with their creature. When they attack, they tap, and then you can kill it with a Royal. So this was a well-known uh, combo back in the day. And what I like, what I want to discuss about Royal Assassin is this word, the word pub. Think about the amount of magic cards, and let's just stick to old school magic cards, so 93 and 94, the amount of old school magic cards that actually have a word in the art. There are not many. And I'm not talking about the signature of the artist, I'm talking about an actual word like the word pub. Think about it. Let me know in the comments below if you can think of any other card that has an actual word in there. And I'm not talking about a word of, um, 
a, a name or a signature of, of, of an artist. No, an actual word of something like pop. Yeah, think about it, think about it. Um, we've got Raised Dead, Sacrifice. There we go, Scavenging Ghouls, Singer Vampire. Another card from the um, Arabian Nights with Sorcerer's Queen. Terror, I just I love the art of terror. One of the best pieces by Ron Spencer. I mean, his use of space in this is, is just revolutionary. You would think as an artist, I only have such a small canvas to work on. And what Ron did here, he said, you know, I'm just gonna use that space in my advantage instead of in my disadvantage. I just, I love that. Beautiful, beautiful card. There we go, yeah, we've got the unholy strength with the little pentagram on the back. The pentagram's gone in fourth edition. Wall of Bone, Warp Artifact. Yeah, this is something I want to discuss. Zombie Master, right? So if you follow the channel, you know I kind of like zombies. Uh, I have a deck with Zombie Master called Zombie Disco. Um, but there is a downside of the Zombie Master. It's two black and one. It gives all zombies in place Swamp Walk, which makes sense because Lord of Atlantis gives Island Walk. Uh, Goblin King gives Mountain Walk. So this gives Swamp Walk, right? Nothing odd there. But then this dude, it gives one black regenerate. And it doesn't give plus one, plus one. Instead, it gives this regeneration ability. And I guess, I mean, one could argue that regeneration is better than the plus one, plus one. The only problem is that later in Magic, most zombies already you know, got regeneration by themselves. Uh, for example, you've got the Walking Dead in Legends. It already has regeneration. So that makes Zombie Master arguably the worst Lord of the three. Let me know which Lord you think is the worst. Don't get me wrong, despite that fact, I love playing with him. Don't worry, I keep playing with you, Zombie Master. Don't worry. Um, and I guess then it's time to, yeah, I can already see it. It's time to start with the next color. We're gonna start with the color red. Okay, and here we go. We have arrived at the color red. So red, of course, is known for its burn, the dragons, the goblins. and uh, But I want to discuss another epic creature in red, a reprint from uh, Antiquities, the Atog. And I'll just share a little nice fact with you. When Revised got printed, at that time in Magic the Gathering, Atog was the most printed card in the entire game. <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous, but yeah, ATOC. So remember that, ATOC, most printed card, crazy stuff. So many ATOCs everywhere. Um, at my LGS, there was a bin where people would throw their ATOCs in and you could just get a free ATOC out. And it's quite ironic that now in modern old school, you actually have a tier one deck that's built around ATOC. ATOC is a super strong creature, actually. It's really, really good. Um, Talking about the olden days, they used to combine Dwarven Warriors with this dude, the Dragon Well. This was a well-known uh, combo back in the day. So you can use your Dwarven Warriors to make target creature with power no greater than two unblockable. So you can make your Whelp unblockable, then attack with the Whelp, and then you can blow it up, right? For one red, you can give it plus one, plus oh. If you do that three times, uh, it stays alive, so it becomes a five, three. If you do it more than that, it uh, it dies at the end of the turn. So the cool thing is you can, uh, yeah, kind of, you know, blow it up, deal a lot of damage. And then we also have Disintegrate. So that's another interesting card, right? Disintegrate does the same thing as, uh, as Swords because it removes a creature from the game. There are not a lot of cards in old school that can actually do that, but they integrate in Swords of Plowshares or two of the cards that actually can do that. And um, because it can remove a creature from the game, it can actually kill regeneration creatures. So it can kill a Satch Troll, for example, you cannot regenerate it. And that makes Disintegrate pretty good. And actually, uh, it makes it so that some people prefer Disintegrate over Fireball. Now, obviously, the plus side of Fireball is that you can hit multiple targets with one Fireball if you have enough mana, of course. Talking about Fireball, here we see the Fireball's lovely Fire Elemental, but I actually want to talk about another Elemental, and that is the Earth Elemental. So the Earth Elemental is a 4-5 for 2 red and 3, and the reason I want to talk about it is that um, it doesn't see a lot of play, because there are usually better options, I guess, but 
Don't underestimate the five toughness. The five toughness makes this card better than you may think at first sight. And if you've played against an Urn Gym, you probably know why I'm saying that. You know, five toughness is just really annoying and difficult to deal with for most decks. So don't underestimate the five toughness. Uh, ooh, we've got the lovely Earth Bind with that art, of course. Beautiful art by Quentin Hoover. And um, this is just made to put on a hypnotic specter, right? You actually see this card a lot in uh, alpha, beta only formats. Um, and it's really good in those formats. Oop, gotta put it in like this. We see Earthquake really good with Gravity Sphere. Then, ah, Flash Fires Fork. Fork is such a cool card. So Fork used to be restricted and now it's no longer uh, restricted. So you can just play with four forks in your deck. And I'm slowly starting to see more and more decks that try to take advantage of this because, you know, simply when you play four fork, just play with a lot of cards that you want to copy. And when you play old school, you're going to run into to those blue power cards. Well, you've got an Ancestral Recall. Guess what? I've got an Ancestral Recall. You're going to counter me. Guess what? I'm going to counter your fork and I'm going to counter your counter. I mean, fork, just a really good card. Maybe it should see more play. Then again, I mean, for every card you put in your deck, you gotta take a card out. That's always the hard part. Um, then we've got Goblin King, we've got Goblin Balloon Brigade, Granite Gargoyle with the epic flavor text. If you don't know the flavor text, just take a moment to read about it, about the Underworld cookbook. And then, oh yeah, this is, this is a page that I find really, really interesting. Look. Only vanilla creatures, vanilla, vanilla, vanilla. So a vanilla creature is a creature that um, just has no ability. So it has no flying, no first strike, no whatever. No, it's just a creature flavor text. That's it, vanilla creature. And for me, this really shows um, the design in old school magic and a design that for me as a player, I can follow that design. I can follow the idea of the more mana you spent on something, the better the card is. I really like that. And that really goes for creatures, especially in old school. So for example, this is one red and two, right? So it's only a two, two. But if it's two red and one, it's a little bit harder to cast. And because it's harder to cast, it's got an extra toughness. So it's a two, three. Then if you spend yet another mana, you spend four mana, you get a three, three giant, right? And then when you spend five mana, if we go a little bit back, you can cast an Earth Elemental or a Fire Elemental. For me, this makes perfect sense. I, I kind of feel like later on in the game, I kind of lost the um, the sensible way of how they use casting cost. Anyway, that's just my two cents. And then here we see the, oh, let me just get the page in. We see Keldon Warlord. Beautiful, beautiful art. Unfortunately, it doesn't see a lot of play because just, it's really tough to play with creatures, you know? If you commit too many creatures to the board, you're very vulnerable to board wipes and to balances and stuff like that, but it's still a really cool card. Yeah, I should play with this again. I used to play with it. Um, then we've got Kurt Ape. Taiga Kurt Ape Go used to be a, a, a play that you would see all the time. It's just so powerful, right? Because this card originally from the Antiquities, it is two, three, four, one red if you can play it with the Taiga or if in your second turn you can play out of Forest. It is just really, really powerful. What I like about this card is again, that it invites you to brew a certain way. It gives you this little incentive uh, without telling you exactly what to play, but you're kind of thinking, okay, Taiga, so I'm gonna play red, green. I'm gonna play small creatures because of Curl is really cheap and high value. So kind of the deck makes itself, but you still need to make those individual choices, if you know what I mean. I really like that about Curl then here we see Lightning Bolt, so part of that boon cycle that I keep talking about. Lightning Bolt, just one of the best cards in Magic and definitely one of the best cards in the set. And then here we go, yeah, Magnetic Mountain, such an interesting card. This guy, nobody plays with this card. Um, so it's I'm just gonna show it to you because I think a lot of you probably don't even know what it does, right? So it's two red and one, it's from Arabian Nights originally, it's an enchantment. Blue creatures do not untap as normal during their upkeep phase. Players must spend four for each blue creature they wish to untap. So it basically is a paralyze for a blue creature, for every blue creature. 
This cost must be paid in addition to any other untapped costs a given blue creature may already require. Now, yes, this is not a great card and I understand why it doesn't see a lot of play. However, there are some decks that really commit heavily uh, into blue creatures, especially the blue aggro decks. So this could work. Although maybe for aggro, it comes a little bit too late in the game, but I, 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 I would like to try this out. I think it's cool. Maybe, maybe combine it with, um, with Slide of Mind that I can change blue into another color. That would be, anyway, anyway, that's, that's another strategy. Um, Mana Flare, Mana Barbs, Mia Jin, uh, a lot of power for the casting cost, three only to cast for six power, that's pretty heavy. Orcish Artillery, um, this card is only one red and one if you got the alpha copy, but the normal copy, two red and one. Okay, here we see another one of those cards that only works when you play uh, with Mana Burn, and that is Power Search. So I'm just going to take it out. So Power Search 2, Red to cast for an enchantment. That reads, at the beginning of a player's turn, before the untapped phase, the player must take a counter for each of his or her lands that is not tapped. Um, during the player's upkeep, Power Search does 1 damage to that player for each counter. The counters are then discarded. So the cool thing about Power Search is um, you're forcing your opponent to use all of his or her mana at the end of the turn. If they don't, they're gonna, you know, take damage for all the unspent lands, right? All the unspent mana. Um, you cannot use this when you're playing in a format without mana burn, because if you're playing without mana burn, your opponent can simply tap all the lands and you don't get punished for it. So, but it's it's really cool in like a format like Atlantic and formats that have mana burn. I've, I've built a deck with it. I had some success. I had some success. It wasn't great, but I could have done better, I think, but I had some success. Yeah, Rock Hydra's Rock of Courage, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Look, look at this page. I love these creatures. Uh, Sextral, really, really good creature in old school. Just three mana for a 3-3 three, three with Regenerate. Really, really good card if you've got a Badlands. And it sees a lot of play, of course, in Troll Disco. And then we go here to the Shatters and the Shatter Storms and the, ah, the Shiva Dragons. Who would have thought that I would ever own four Sheevan Dragons? I mean, little Timmy could only dream of owning four Sheevan Dragons. I remember if you would play against somebody who had a Sheevan, it's like, okay, you've won already. You're the man. Like if you had a Sheevan. Amazing power. Really the one of the poster boys for the revised set. And one of the most valuable cards of the set at the time. There we see Stone Giant, Smoke. Couple of stone rains. Let me show the page properly. There we go. Ooh, we're almost at green. There we see the tunnels, wall of fire. So um, a nice thing, you know what? I'm gonna show that later. Cause yeah, I can show you now, but a nice thing about Richard Thomas, he's made a lot of wall art. And if you look closely to the art, you can see that the wizard that is behind the wall is always being portrayed. So yeah, if you look, it's kind of hard to see, I think now, but um, you know what? You can see it better in the wall of ice. So you can see a little shadow here. If you look closely, the wall of fire, but wall of water has it as well. Wall of air has it, wall of ice has it, the wall that I'm gonna uh, show you in a moment. So all the walls or most walls by Richard Thomas actually have the, uh, the wizard or the avatar, whatever you wanna call it, standing on the other side of the wall which I think is really, really neat that he did that, you know? This kind of connecting, um, you know, your art and your style together over different cards, I like that. Ooh, before we move on to green though, we gotta talk about one of the most valuable cards in the set. This card's actually more valuable at the moment than certain dual lands in the set. Wheel of Fortune. Yeah, insane. Beautiful card, one red and two to cast for a sorcery, art by Daniel Gallen. And all players must discard their hand and draw seven new cards. Yeah, it's a beautiful card. Again, I only have one copy because it's restricted. So of all the restricted cards, I only have one copy because this is really a collection for me uh, to play with. So that's why I made that decision. And also, can you imagine trying to get four revised Wheel of Fortunes? <laughs> right? And you gotta make choices in life. Like you can also get other cards for that. Or, or food, 
I guess. But anyway, um, I'm rambling. So Wheel of Fortune, a nice, really nice card to kind of finish red with. And now we're entering the realm of green. Okay, we are going to dive into green. And the first card here is Aspect of Wolf. I kind of like putting my uh, an Aspect of Wolf on my Enchantress. This is one of the more like complicated cards at the time. I remember I had to do a lot of calculating. So it's one green and one for an enchant creature and it reads, target creature's power and toughness are increased by half the number of forests you have in play, rounding down for power and up for toughness. So if you have five forests in play, your creature will get plus two, plus three. And the toughness aspect is actually pretty good when you're playing green and when you want to protect, protect your Fujian Enchantress, which we'll see later, not in this binder. I have to get my second binder, because look at this. We're almost done with another full binder. So here we see the last page of this binder, Elfish Archer, epic, epic, epic art by Anson Maddox. Oh man, so cool. Let me see if I can show that, yep. A really good card, a rare as well. It used to see a lot of play, but now because of Mishra's Factory, it doesn't see that much play anymore. And of course it's very vulnerable because of that one toughness, but that first strike makes it really good. And then we see Channel, of course, Channel Fireball, infamous combination. Again, a restricted card, so only a one-off here in this binder. Uh, we're seeing Cockatrice, so like the Flying Thicket Basilisk. We're gonna talk about Thicket in a moment, but Cockatrice, this is basically the flyer of green for five. And I mean, green is kind of an interesting um, color in that perspective, because when you think about green, you probably think about big beefy creatures for like not a lot of mana, right? So you got a good deal, a good bang for your buck. But when you look at flying creatures in green, it's actually pretty bad. Okay, they do have script sprites, which is really good. You know, a one-one flyer for one green. But Cockatrice, it's five mana and it only has two power. It does have a pretty unique ability, like the Thicket Basilisk ability. But in a lot of green strategies, you want to have more power for five, you know? And I think that's one of the reasons that it doesn't see a lot of play. But actually, once the Cockatrice is out, it, it's a great protection. Like, I've, I've played with it and it's been, it's done really well for me. Okay, so this is binder number two. Are you still with me? <laughs> let, let me know in the comments below if you're watching this as, as one goal or if you're putting this on in the background or maybe you are um, uh, watching this in parts that you just pause it and then later on you watch it. Or probably you've already clicked away, that's also fine. And let's see, here we go, the next binder. I'm just gonna take a zip of my tea here. It's, a, it's afternoon while I'm recording this movie and it's pretty dark and cloudy here. Mm. It's the perfect afternoon to kind of go through my revised set and uh, look at the cards again and enjoy these cards. So we're gonna open it up. Talking about enjoying cards, let me just make sure it's nice and straight. Talking about enjoying cards here, we see the crawl worms. That's so beautiful. Love the art of crawl worm. And this is a card, again, I talked about accessibility a lot, right, in this video, because when you start playing Magic, you don't have, or at least when you're younger, right, you don't have the funds to just buy any card you want. So Crawler was this great common, uh, it was a huge creature, and it was accessible. So, I mean, I used to play with Crawler, and my friends used to play with Crawler, it was just, you know, six mana for a big beefy creature, and creatures... That was the general consensus, you need creatures to win the game. So you, the bigger the creatures are, the more chances you have of actually winning the game. Here we go with the Crumble, uh, Desert Twister, which is, Desert Twister is really good. Again, a card from one of those expansions, Crumble as well, by the way, Crumble Antiquities, uh, Desert Twister comes from Arabian Nights. It's a really good card, but it's six to cast, which is pretty steep. But if you've got the six mana, it destroys any card in play. And what I've always liked about it is the fact that, you know, green is the color that can ramp, right? You've got Llanowar Elves, you've got Birds of Paradise, you've got Wild Grove, you've got Untamed Wilds. So with green, you can uh, um, uh, get, I want to say, accumulate. Is that how you pronounce it? Anyway, if you want to get a lot of mana, um, it's quite easy with green. And then you can start destroying stuff with Desert Twister. Nobody does it though, so I guess it's not a good strategy, but I, I always like that idea. 
And here we go. Yeah, wow, look at this. Oh, isn't it beautiful? I just, I can really enjoy like a page like this. I think it's great. We've got the epic birds of paradise, right? Bolt the bird. We've got the beautiful fast bond with that, with that fairy tale wizard. And again, fast bond is, it's one of those cards that invites me to brew. And that's why I love the cards. The same thing can be said for Fungusar. The same thing can be said for Gaius Leech. Gaius Leech, a unique card in the game. I've, I've, I've played a match with Gaius Leech. It's fun. I had a deck with it, but I do understand why nobody plays with it. But it is an epic card and it, it's a unique card. And it's actually been, um, the creature type has been updated to summon Avatar. So it's one of the avatars in the game, uh, in the early game of Magic. And then we've got Force of Nature, six mana for an 8-8 eight, eight Trample Powerhouse. Of course, you've got to pay the mana. But then again, if you can't, uh, it doesn't matter that much because, yeah, it deals eight damage to you, but you can still attack with it. And that's basically what you want to do, right? You want to attack. So that's really nice. And then we've got the next page here, Giant Spider and Giant Grove. I always like that, uh, to Giant Giant, your Giant Spider. And here we have the Grizzly Bear. So a bear, right? A bear is a 2-2 two, two for two. That's um, That comes from the Grizzly, grizzly Bear. And um, let's have a look. Hurricane, Instal Energy. I love to put an Instal Energy on a Colossus of Sardia. So Instal Energy, one green. Um, you may untap target creature one additional time um, during your turn, target creature may also attack the turn it comes into play. So if you combine instal energy with your Birds of Paradise, when you have a stasis in play, you basically have, you know, infinite ma infinite blue mana, well, not infinite blue mana, but you have to one blue mana over and over again to pay for the upkeep cost of your stasis because you can tap for one blue to pay for the stasis upkeep cost. And then with instal energy, you can untap it one time, one extra time a turn. So that's kind of a combo that you used to see a lot in those days. Still pretty cool. And then you would have like a Sarah Angel or something or a Yoshin Soldier, uh, something that doesn't have to tap when it attacks to kind of win the game for you. And yeah, here we see the Kudzus. Oh yeah, this is kind of nice. Living Artifact. Um, as you can see there, here there's two print dots. Now let me just get it on screen properly. So you really see two print dots. This is a common known error, error, I should say error, error, do you say error? Common known error in the um, in the print sheet. So you've got this version of Living Artifact without the print dot, and you've got this version with the print dot. And um, yeah, I just have both. Two of each, I thought it was good. Living Lands, hilarious art. Then we have Lanor Elves, so Lanor Elves, the, the famous Mana Dork, uh, Lure, so Lure is really good with Thicket Basilisk. Let me just take it out. We can discuss it later, so I'll put it there. Again, we've got one of the restricted cards. And then we have that Script Sprites that I talked about. So just a 1-1 one, one flyer for one, it's good, trust me. Um, yeah, and here we've got Thicket Basilisk, right? So Thicket and Lure, this is what you want to do in life. So Thicket Basilisk, five mana. It's basically a cockatrice, but then it doesn't have flying. And it reads, any non wall creature blocking Basilisk is destroyed, as is any creature blocked by Basilisk. Creatures destroyed this way deal, um, deal their damage before dying. Now, um, people confuse this ability with Death Touch. This is actually better than Death Touch because you don't have to deal damage with the Thicket. As soon as the creature is declared as a blocker of the Thicket Basilisk, the creature is dead, right? So uh, if you put a lure on here and you attack, everything has to block the Thicket of your opponent, and that means that your opponent is going to lose all their creatures. And then, of course, if you would put a regeneration on it, wow, then you can regenerate it and you can do it again. So you can put a regeneration on there. How about that, right? But then if they got one sword, you lose three cards, but hey, that's the life of a wizard. Um, here we see another card I want to discuss, Timberwolves. I want to talk about it because it's just, this is a rare, right? We, we looked at Banala Shiro earlier in this video. Banala Shiro is a common in white, a 1-1 one, one for one white banding. This is one green, 1-1 one, one banding, and this is a rare. 
right? So I've, I've always found that um, fascinating. So we've got the Titania song, just such a fun card to brew with. And yeah, Tsunami, this is, oh man, this card is such a killer. All islands in play are destroyed. If somebody plays this against my Timmy deck, I'm done for, absolutely done for. And my pirate ship sinks. I think that's the worst thing. I don't mind losing the mana, but the fact that my pirate ship sinks, that's just, yeah. It's when that happens, it's, it's heavy, it's heavy. Oh, maybe nice thing to, this may be the most perfect magic card ever, Stream of Life. Why would you call it the most perfect magic card ever? Because the rules text never changed. This has been reprinted so many times, but the rules text always stayed the same. Now that is some good card design if you ask me. We're just gonna put it back, just wanted to share that with you. It's pretty exceptional. We've got the Fajorian Enchantress. She's a beauty and, and, and quite unique because you've got card drawing green all of a sudden. It's like, what? But yeah, you do with Wall of, uh, with Fajorian Enchantress. We've got Wall of Brambles, Wall of Ice. Now this is a wall where you can really clearly see the mage standing at the other side of it. So here you've got the wall, again by Richard Thomas, just like the Wall of Fire we looked at earlier. And here in the back, you can see a man with a cane. So a wizard holding up a stick. And it kind of looks like he wants to get through the wall, but he can't, right? Or is he actually the wizard that has cast summoned this Wall of Ice? You know, holding up and say, you know, holding this up to summon the Wall of Ice? That could be the case. Either way, it's, it's quite interesting art, and it's art that you can really look at for a longer period of time, and I just, I love that. I love this card in general. It's an 07 for three mana. It's, it's, it's strong. Another card that I've always liked because of his art and not because of what it does is Wonderlust. Let me try to take it out of here. So Wonderlust. Beautiful art by Cornelius Broody. Hasn't made a lot of art for old school, for magic. Um, but I really, really like this piece. I guess you could still use this in a deck. Again, I'm going, the way this used to be played is you play out a lot of walls to protect yourself and then you just put Wanderlust on the creatures of your opponent and they will slowly die to the Wanderlust. Um, but yeah. That's kind of a hard strategy to win with in, in modern days of magic, but still, it's a, it's a cool thing to do. Okay, I like it. And ooh, we're almost at the end of, uh, of green, and then we're entering the realm of the dual lands. Um, Lutus, a card I want to discuss before we enter the dual lands, shenanigans, it's web. I've already mentioned it a few times. When you buy a booster pack of revise, there are some pretty questionable rares that you can actually pull. One of them is Web. I mean, this is an Inchiant creature. Target creature gains plus O plus two and now can block flying creatures, though it does not gain the flying ability. Yeah, this, this card, it's just not very good, but it is very flavorful because obviously this is the ability of the giant spider. Um, so I do like the flavor of the card, but the fact that it's a rarity, in my opinion, they should have made it an uncommon. Um, it does kind of work surprisingly well with Fajorian Enchantress. I saw somebody play it in their Enchantress deck and I usually choose to go for Aspect of Wolf or Regeneration, um, you know, to kind of protect my Enchantress when I'm playing only with green. But the fact that this is just one green to put on the Enchantress makes it better than you think, actually, in that context. There we see the beautiful Wild Groves and I guess now it's time to enter the realm of the dual lands. Okay, we are finished with green behind this page or the dual lands, the revised dual lands, the last core set that still had reprints of the dual lands. Let's just, let's just have a look and I can show you my collection. Um, so here we see the bad lands. Let me just try to get it on camera properly for you. So here we see the Badlands, and you can probably already see the problem that I have with my collection of Badlands because, um, yeah, I've got one unsigned and three signed. The thing is, I want to keep at least one unsigned. I know this is a, a, a big problem, right? First world problems. But I want to keep at least 
one unsigned for for my collection um and yeah the thing is with rob alexander he just loves to sign cards there's so many signed cards by rob alexander but preferably and i i like signed cards i have nothing against signed cards i own a lot but in this specific collection i think oh sorry hitting the camera here um i want to try to um get unsigned badlands because all these cards are unsigned as well the other dual lands Talking about the other dual lands, um, this dual land sees the least play in old school magic, the Bayou. And, and maybe that can be an incentive for you to try to brew something with Bayou. At the moment, I'm trying to build a Naughty Enchantress, as I've called it. So that's Fijuran Enchantress with black. So the Bayou will definitely go in that deck. And uh, oh, Plateau has a little story. So Plateau has different arts than the plateau that you see in Alpha Beta Unlimited. So this is a different piece of art than the actual plateau. So you've got an unlimited version with different art, Alpha Beta Unlimited, I should say, and then you've got the revised version. And um, actually the, the unlimited, the only unlimited dual land that I have is plateau. So I've also got a play set of unlimited plateaus. So it's kind of funny, because then you have the same card, but different art. Savannah used to be one of the cheaper dual lands. I believe it still is. Usually dual lands with, with green in them are, used to be cheaper, but now of course green became a stronger color, I believe. So people are playing it in EDH and stuff. That has a huge impact on the price of dual lands with green, but it used to be that dual lands with green were cheaper. I think now dual lands with white are probably the cheapest, right? But correct me if I'm wrong here in the comments below. Just Savannah, playing a Savannah Lions with a Savannah, that's what you want to do in life, right? Isn't that what you want to do? I mean, I just love it when flavor makes sense, just like playing uh, a Tundra, using a Tundra to cast a Tundra Wolves. Let me just try to get it all right for you here. So we see more dual lands. And here we also see the more valuable dual lands. Um, for the longest of times, maybe it's still the case, Underground Sea used to be the most valuable one, followed by Volcanic Island, and then you would get the Tundra. I believe that the tables have changed slightly in today's market. I think Tropical Island is now really sought after the most, probably because of the modern Magic players, right? The green has become a really good color, I understand. Um, one of the cheaper dual lands for the longest of time has always been Taiga, but I think that's no longer the case now. So Taiga is a yeah, really good card. Let me kind of show that side. Uh, I, wish, I wish I had a better camera. I could show you the whole thing at once, but unfortunately it is what it is. But yeah, I mean, this is a page like this makes me very happy. I feel very fortunate. And most of all, what this does is whenever you have a play set of dual lands complete, it, you can kind of enter a whole new deck, right? And, and, and that's the way it used to be for me when, when I didn't have all these dual lands. Whenever I had a combination of dual lands, I would immediately build a deck around them, kind of to show, okay, this is what I can do with this color combination. And that's what I've always liked about collecting these dual lands. I mean, I remember when these were, were 10 guilders, that's like $5, and they were considered quite pricey for $5. And here we see the basic lands. The basics. Maybe I should let's 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 go back to the duels. Let's go back to duels. Let me just show you a nice close up of a duel. So here we see. I think the underground C art wise probably my favorite art by Rob Alexander, followed very closely by the Tundra. Although Tropical Island is also beautiful, it's hard to choose. Here's the Tundra. As you can see, um, yeah, my dual lands are not all minty fresh, <laughs> but but hey, uh, I'm using them to play, and I just really like, I'm happy with the condition that they're in. Some are more pretty than others. I think this Volcanic Island is really nice. So this is the color combination I used to play as a Timmy, a young Timmy. And I also like this Tropical Island. Jesper Mirfors, the artist, has said that he's painted himself somewhere along the tree line. I have never found him, but that's what he claims. So if you've got a copy of Tropical Island, have a close look and see if you can spot Jesper Mirfors. 
So yeah, so this is my revised collection. And maybe I just have one more page I could show you with a few signed cards. So um, let me just try to get it incorrectly. So here we see some boosters, just empty boosters. And we see some um, uh, Christopher Rush signings. I think this lightning bolt is really nice. And I also have a couple of uh, Mark Pools. And the nice thing about Mark Pool is earlier signatures and I'm not an expert with signatures, but I do know this. I know his earlier signatures were like this with the ballpoint pen. And then later on, he started to use a marker like you see here. And he just has a lot of different um, signatures. The cool thing is you can actually look it up and you can find exactly uh, when he used what signature, what year. The same thing goes for Christopher Rush. So you've got different levels of rarity when it comes to the signatures as well. And here you can see some more like restricted cards. I've just put them here. Uh, the reason I have them is just, I, I played them in a lot of decks. So yeah, I got a couple of extra ones. And I still think that Regrowth is such a good card and it's still really, really uh, cheap to get. So whenever I see one, I just take one with me. Although I now really have enough for my deck, so I don't need any more. But that's why I've got four of these. Anyway, um, thank you for watching uh, this very long and huge episode of Timmy Talks where I show my full collection of uh, Revised. Please let me know in the comments below what your favorite card in Revised is and why. I would love to hear from you. Um, and in general, if you want to support the channel, uh, please like this video, leave a comment, uh, share it on your socials. And of course, if you're new to the channel, welcome here at Timmy Talks. Please consider subscribing and ring that bell. And if you've done all that, you've got my gratitude, you know, you're helping Timmy Talks grow. There's one last thing you can do, and that is become a patron of the channel. And by becoming a patron, um, you're supporting the channel financially as well. It already starts with $1 a month. And the cool thing is you get access to the Timmy Talks uh, Discord page, and your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every video. And that includes this video, by the way. So let's take a look at our fantastic, amazing, wunderbar channel members and patrons. Of Timmy Talks. Here we go. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Ik het dus vind het dus somber gezien.